Do you have a first musical memory? First time I remember being moved by a song was Blowing in the Wind, but it wasn't sung by Bob Dylan, it was sung by Val Dunican on television when I was a kid. But even in, in Val's homely performance of it, I, I could feel the, the, the mystery and beauty of the song. Tell me about the sounds of your childhood. Well, I, I grew up listening to pop music. In those days, uh, the charts actually reflected the, the listening tastes of the nation. Uh, and, and, and I used to love listening to the, the radio and the top 30 and listen to all the records that, that were out. And, and me and my mother and father would buy me a single every Saturday. And I, I would fall in love with records. You know, later I fell in love with girls, but first I fell in love with records. Specific records, you know, I'd fall in love with a new single by the Hollies and I c couldn't relax until I heard it again. And in those days, because there's no streaming or anything, you were dependent on, on either catching it on the radio or once in a blue moon on the TV or, or you had to go to a record shop and ask to hear it. A lot of people talk to me about the idea of being exposed to multiple listens of records, of playing things to death. Yeah. So do you think this is perhaps the beginning of when the idea of song structure starts to go in? It took me a long time to unpack what I, I heard in records. You know, I say I fell in love with the record, I fell, fell in love with the whole thing. You know, when I listen to music now, if I'm traveling, it, it, it's almost a, a technical exercise when I listen to music. I hear the mix, I hear the bass drum sound, I hear the, the compression and the EQ and the voice. I hear every single element in its place and, and I think about how they've put it together. But when I was a kid, I just heard a whole, I heard a balloon of sound and, and it was all magic to me and I didn't differentiate between different parts of it, including song structure. And I don't think it was until I started listening to, to Bob Dylan records seriously at about 12 or 13, uh, and I had a Bob Dylan lyric book as well, that was very helpful, that I, I really noticed structure. And of course, Bob, Bob was a great man for, for breaking the rules on structure. So uh, the kind of song structure lessons I learned were Side-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands and Visions of Johanna, Stuck Inside a Mobile with the Memphis Blues again. And, and these endless, endless verses, uh, verse after verse after verse with no real chorus. And so I learned all these sort of corruptions of song structure first. It was a very good education. Tell me about the transition from the music that you hear in your head and how that might become an idea for a song. That's, that's a very difficult question. I'm not sure it really does. Or does it? I don't know. I try not to be too aware of my songwriting process. I like to let it have its own natural life without too much conditioning from me or control from me. So probably sometimes I'll have a tune in my head and that will turn into a song. But I can't tell you which songs began like that. Uh, and, and more often I think I'm playing an instrument, I'm playing the guitar, I'm playing the piano, and something strikes me and, and I work on that. So do you remember any early attempts to write a song? Um, probably like most, most songwriters, I began copying. You know, I would write my version of a Bob Dylan song or my version of a John Lennon song. But, but that was never satisfying. I was never satisfied with that. I wanted my, my own stuff, I wanted my own original um, words and music. And I would just write. The breakthrough was when I got given a piano. A student of my mother's noticed that I loved music. His name was John Milroy, and he had a piano that he didn't play, and he gave it to us. And so it went into my bedroom. And I played this piano for years. And, and that was really my breakthrough in songwriting and finding my own original style. And because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a trained musician, I, I taught myself to play piano 
I discovered the chords. I remember discovering an A minor and a G and an F, realizing you could play all along the watchtower with those three. Uh, and then actually I could write my own songs if I changed the order of them and so on. If I put my hand down, I could get a bass note. It was very exciting. And, and I played that piano so hard for so many years that lots of the, the keys stopped working. And, and I didn't realize that I could go to the piano shop in town and a nice man would come and he would, he would fix them. And I didn't realize that. So I sort of retreated to the black keys. And for several years, all the songs I wrote were on the black keys because they were the only ones that would work. <laughs> People talk about the idea of finding your voice. To what extent were you aware of your singing voice and, and how does that affect the melodies that you write? You know, people who sing hear their voice inside their head. And it's always a shock when you first hear your voice in a tape recorder. And in my early days as a singer, I really liked the way my voice sounded in my head and I didn't like how it sounded on tape. I'm in good company there. John Lennon was the same. He was forever asking George Martin to change the sound, make it sound like an orange was one of, one of my favorite quotes of his. And I, I remember when I was in my first band singing and, and we, we didn't have any PA or anything. And if we recorded us, I just had to go close to the tape recorder microphone to be heard. And it was very primitive and, and my voice would sound very disembodied from the band. And, and I would think, well, I don't, I don't really sound like that. But I just stuck with it. There was nothing I could do about it. That was my voice. And, that's just the way it was. Can you tell me about writing Medicine Bow? Medicine Bow was from a riff that our sax player, Anthony, played on guitar. He played an E minor to A riff late one night at my flat, and, and I, I liked it and remembered it, and the next day I used it for a song. That was Medicine Bow. I'd, I'd written Medicine Bow, and I, I, I thought it was finished. 
It had three verses and three choruses. But, but I was just about to, to put my guitar down and move on to something else when I got this feeling inside, this sort of scratch inside me, like a sort of incomplete feeling, a niggle, you could say. And I thought, what's going on? And it seemed to be communicating to me that I should pick up the guitar again and try harder to find a new part of the song. Well, in those days, I hadn't really yet learned how to write middle eights. But it occurred to me, oh, maybe maybe I should be writing a middle eight. So I picked up the guitar and I started writing a middle eight. And the middle eight started to come. It was a shift into a different different chord and a, a different resolution. And then it had a triumphant return to the verse, which most good middle eights should have. And I realized that this little itch inside me was, was instructing me. And that was the day that I became aware that music was telling me what to do inside. It was a really wonderful, wonderful breakthrough. And I restructured my life from that point so that I could always hear what those instructions were doing. So do you believe in the idea of the muse? Well, the, the little voice inside that I'm describing to you that gives me the, the niggle when I haven't finished something properly or, or gives me an inspirational direction, that to me is, is the muse. And, and the muse is a tough master because if I don't pay attention to that, I screw up the song. Uh, and, and, and I've seen artists who've, who've taken decisions in their careers, at least it seems to me, that have taken them away from what's inspired them. And I've seen someone who spent decades trying to get back to it. I had my own difficult times, maybe, maybe from about 87 to 93, 94, where I'd made decisions in my personal life that I didn't feel comfortable with, relationships I was in, and, and I couldn't, at that point, I couldn't access um, my, how would you say it, my essential self, or, or a, a, a therapist would say my core self, and I felt separated from, from myself. And, and during those years, it was difficult for me to, to get back to those places, but, but I found my way through the maze of my decisions and back to my center. Uh, and I've never, never taken those bad decisions or similar bad decisions again. But I can see that that, that that making those kind of, I suppose, personal betrayals of, of oneself, whether, whether in relationships or life decisions or in musical decisions, can take the artist away from what, what from, from where the instruction is or where the magic is. Can playing an instrument be like a form of meditation for you? And can you get lost in that? And might that be a good setting for something to happen? I don't have to get lost in the music to make a song out of it, but I can be meditative with music, especially when I was in my 20s and I was a pot smoker. I used to sit and play all these chord sequences and, and just drift off into them, and I would get so... in. in so intrigued by the tones on the guitar. It was so beautiful. I can still do that. I don't need pot to do it now. I just do it actually now. But I, I can do that play for ages and ages, just getting into the very subtle differences and the tonal qualities. Do you know, when I was, was, when I was in my mid-twenties, I discovered systems music as well, people like Steve Reich and Philip Glass. And that music is built on those qualities. So I love that very much. There's, a, there's, a, there's an innocence, perhaps, in... in early songs in your career when it's new. And after you've been writing songs for 30 or 40 years, is it a challenge to try and recapture that sense of innocence, you know, when perhaps you know too much? I can never undo the things I know. I can never undo the way that I hear a record and, and know what the mixing engineer has been thinking and so on. I can never undo that and I realize why the songwriter finished the lyric like that or or put this section and I can never undo what I've learned but I can suspend it when I'm writing I can suspend my own it's like compartmentalizing the, the part of me that can edit and and oversee supervise I can suspend I can send that guy out of the room while I'm I'm playing guitar and digging it and grooving on something and that's where I need to be psychologically when I'm writing. And the other guy can come into the room later. Do you know what I mean? I can suspend him. I heard you say that you can be 
young Mike again. You can be different Mikes yeah. from different periods of your yeah. life. Yeah, I'm still in tune with all the different old me's that I've been. I don't know why that is. Maybe I haven't ever sold them out or I haven't kind of done stuff that's made it difficult for me to get back to the way I used to feel about things. But but I can access all the different different eras. Oh, when I'm on stage, I can step into the, the way that I felt when I wrote a song. I don't have any difficulty with any of that. I'm, I'm very grateful that it's, it is so. So, How Long Will I Love You, which has recently been a huge hit for Ellie Goulding. Yes. Can you tell me about the genesis of that song? Yeah, that was a songwriting exercise. You know, most of my songs come from personal experience or some deep feelings. That one didn't. It was like a songwriting exercise. I had the title and out it came with its tune. And it's seven verses. It's quite an economic song. It was a good exercise. And, but I never felt very attached to it. It was one of my least favorite of my songs. Really, yeah. Uh, and, and then over the years, uh, I forgot all about it. And, and Richard Curtis who made, made those movies like uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral and so on. He wanted it for his movie About Time. He's, he's a huge Waterboys fan. And he's a mate as well. And he, he wanted that song for his film. And I said, OK. Uh, and he had Ellie record it. He didn't use her verse in the film. I think he wanted a male voice because of the context in the film. But Ellie recorded it and I, and I had the hit. And that, that gave me a new, keener appreciation of it. And I liked the way she did it. I liked that it was changed and they had this beautiful string arrangement. Uh, and, and it made me reconsider the song. And, and then around the same time as Ellie the hit, my first child was born and my, my daughter and her mum uh, felt that the song very much expressed how we felt about our child. And so I, I reapproached the song from that perspective too and, and learned an appreciation for it. So now we play it on stage. And, and for the first time, we don't play it as an encore. For some years, we played it as a sort of encore if it was a particularly good night. And I never used to really look forward to it because I still felt it was a bit of a songwriting exercise. Mm -hmm. But now, I've learned how to make it be more of a rock and roller and I play electric guitar on it and I've got the guitar now, now, now. I've got my killer guitar riff worked out. And I really, really dig playing it and the band plays it great. I can't. 
I was interested to hear you talk about how much you like Kendrick Lamar's ideas and productions. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I like hip hop music. I like the DIY side of hip hop music that anything can go in. Found sounds. I love that. It reminds me of, of psychedelia, really. Uh, and of early punk with the, D, the DIY ethos where anybody could play and anybody could design a sleeve. And I like that, that hip hop music uh, uh, it upturns the format of song, completely upturns it. And, and I like sound collages. I like making records that are, I don't know what the adjective from collage is, the collagist in form. I like that. And I, I find hip hop music inspirational for that. So, Mike, can you please tell me about my wanderings in the weary land? Well, I like, I like spoken word songs. I like delivering a song spoken. And I've done quite a lot of it in the last four or five years. I just enjoy it as a creative edge. And my wanderings in the weary land is a spoken word piece over, over a, a repeated chord sequence. And it began life as a sleeve note to a Waterboys album from 25 years ago called uh, A Rock in the Weary Land. Uh, it was the sleeve note for that album. And it was a kind of grotesque journey sleeve note. Um, and a couple of years ago, and I was talking about Richard Curtis there. Richard Curtis had his 60th birthday a few years ago, and, and he particularly liked a Waterboys track called The Return of Jimi Hendrix. It was on an old album. And I recorded a new version called The Return of Richard Curtis and put him into the lyric and filmed myself. It was also a spoken word piece. Filmed myself reciting it and sent it to him to be played at his 60th birthday party. And I'd re-recorded the song, re-recorded the music to go with this lyric. And the re-recording of the music came out really well, and I thought, God, I'd really like to use that for something. But I can't release the return of Richard Curtis on a record, because it was a, you know, it was a one, it was personal. And I didn't want to redo the return of Jimi Hendrix, my original lyric, because it had been on an old record, there was no point in re-recording it. But, but as I say, the music came out so great, I thought, I wonder if I've got something that will fit and this old sleeve note, this My Wanderings in the Weary Land sleeve note, fit with the music. So I don't mind reusing a piece of music 20 years later. It's the same tune, basically, as this old track, The Return of Jimi Hendrix, but with this new lyric delivered, and because it, it's so much better than The Return of Jimi Hendrix. It's a much better record. It's a much better lyric. So I'm very pleased that it happened like that. And, and I don't know what else to say about it. No, no, it's amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm struck by the fact that you haven't repeated yourself in your career, that the sound seems to have been ever-evolving. How important is that? Well, I grew up in the 60s when every Beatles record was staggeringly different from the one before, or Bob Dylan would change direction. He'd do Nashville Skyline and go country, uh, and, and, or someone like Neil Young, and then Bowie in the 70s would change with every record. And, and to me, that's normal. Music should evolve record to record uh, and, and not incrementally. Everybody evolves incrementally, but, but I think music should change dramatically. And I get fascinated by a new kind of music or a new sound or a new expression or a new creative edge, and I want to go there. It's strange how some very big commercial bands seem to have a sound which they stick with for a very long time, don't they? Yeah. It seems to work for them. Well, different strokes for different folks, so I'm not knocking it. It wouldn't work for me. It would bore me senseless. But, you know, you take a group like ACDC, they've sounded the same for their entire career. Hugely popular. People know what they're going to get, and it's going to be great when they get it. If they like that, they're going to get it delivered by ACDC, no problem. It's always going to be at that level. And, and that works. It works for them. Man, it wouldn't work for me. I would need to keep changing. I need to keep, look, it's like Bowie's line, turn and face is strange. I need to be looking at something new, something that's engaging me and taking me somewhere I've never been before. I need the road less traveled.
can't find the frontier Like a soldier who can't find the front I wandered the weary land Until out of the night there came a sound And then a place between the darkness and the break of dawn I found a ruined building filled with a strange congregation Their voices like a cracked orchestra Fascinated, I ventured inside In the half-light, I scrutinized their faces Their features were worn thin like old coats Hung with the wounds of war Drawn, hollow, bereft of certainty The air thick with anger, complaint, and victimhood. I can feel their voices seeping into my mind. My own thought voice raised in bitterness, too. I could become one of them. I turn toward the only bright light. A faint shard of silver in the dim distance, as if at the end of a tunnel. I was present at the birth and funeral of Madison. I heard the great unspoken, saw cruelty masquerade as humor. Passed without seeing it, the unbound door to the undiscovered country. Drank from a well in the wilderness and wrote my songs in foreign rooms. Lived through an unspeakable day, clean sickness from my wounds. Saw crowds upon the highway and flowers on the roof of a car. I rode in the company of the invisible captain. Abandoned my tobacco in dark, peaceful, 964 Lucille Avenue. Love that was love, gambled and lost, wept, thought, was able at least once to say, this place is love's fortress, and so am I. Finally to emerge from the winter of my journey into the gray light of a small, damp dawn, and so set for this. The testament of my wanderings in the weary land And set for this
got a sense from your book that you had very clearly defined beliefs at quite a young age of what your bands would sound like. Where do you think that came from? Well, I'm, I'm Scottish, and, and Scottish people are, are very cut and dried about their music. Do you know, a bit fascistic about our music. Ah, it's fucking shite, mate. That's what Scottish people say if they don't like a song. Or it's a bit all right if they like it. Uh, uh, the Scotsman who says that's all right, that's a high compliment. But if Scottish people find it very easy to, to dismiss and insult music. And, and I grew up in that atmosphere, that environment, and I think it just encouraged me to have very strong opinions. I had strong opinions about the records I liked and didn't like. I still do. And I had strong opinions about how my songs should sound and shouldn't sound. Having said that, I don't think I was ever a controlling band leader, even when I was a teenager, because people play the way they play and they make the sound they, sound, they, they make. And, and I was thrilled with the sound that some of my early bandmates made beyond my imagination. So mainly you write songs on your own. Um, what are the challenges uh, and joys, if there are any, in co-writing? Well, I'm not one of these guys that sits in a room with another guitar player and how about this chord? I, I can't do that. I did when I was young with my bandmates, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for me. What does work for me is to work collaboratively, independently. Uh, I'll send someone a lyric or I'll send someone a tune or someone sends me a tune or a lyric and, and we work separately but by correspondence and I really like that, really like working like that. Because, see, the music tells me what to do and if I'm in a room with someone, we're talking about music, I can't hear what the music's telling me. It's a very subtle signal, subtle communication, and it happens inside the body. I get a gut feeling when someone's right and I get an itch when it's wrong and I need to be able to be present to that. And when I'm on my own with music and with an instrument, I am. But when I'm with someone else and we're talking, I'm not. So it, that's why it doesn't work for me sitting in a room. I'm not a sit in a room with two guitars kind of guy. I like working on my own because I can hear what the music's telling me to do. So can you tell me about where the action is? Okay. Well, where the action is is an old song from the 60s by Robert Parker. It's an old mod soul record, popular at, at discos. Uh, and in fact, a, a mod disco is where I heard it. I heard Parker's original. And, and uh, I, I particularly noted the chorus. Now, the verse lyrics were, were just about, come on, put your red dress on, baby, we're going to go out dancing. And the action of the title was dance action or romance and dance. But, but I, I had a different idea for it, and I wrote my own verses. So I kept, kept Parker's chorus, come on, baby, where the action is? And then I wrote my own verses. And we, we then approached his publisher to get the rights to change the song. And, and we shared the publishing, of course, and, but we got the right to do it. Like, like so many of these, these songs that are, are northern soul hits, one of the most important things for a, nor a song to be a hit on the northern soul circuit is that it wasn't a hit in the pop charts. Because the northern soul fans like to have their own world. And I love Northern Soul music. And, and actually, uh, a lot of my youth was spent dancing to that music in the, in the discos around the west of Scotland. So I really appreciate it. Uh, and L Let's Go Baby With Action is, is a Northern Soul classic. Uh, and never was a hit in the outside world. And I felt it, it, it deserves its chance, deserves its shot. Unfortunately, our version wasn't a hit either, but we, we rocked it up and, and I love it very much. Say the sweetest victory is in defeat. To could fool the whole world with just one tweet. My sister could jive. She and mommy was cute to see her crushed alive. On the summer's put, let's go play it. Where the action is. Let's 
Tell me the story of the whole of the moon, please. Yeah. And how it came to be. Well, I'll, I'll take an idea for a song from anywhere. It might be a scrap scrap of conversation I hear, or, uh, or um, something I read somewhere, uh, or, or something I see around me. And the whole of the moon came when I was walking down a street in New York in winter with a girlfriend. And she asked me, is it easy to write songs? And so I wanted to show off she was my new girlfriend. I said, yes, it is. And I looked around for inspiration. And we were, we were on one of the avenues in New York, and there was a, a moon. I don't remember now if it was a crescent or a full moon in the sky. I suppose if I looked at an almanac, because I know roughly what date it was, I could find out. But anyway, it's not, not so important. And this line, I saw the crescent, you saw the whole of the moon, came into my head. So I wrote it down on a scrap of paper, and I showed it to my girlfriend, and she was appropriately impressed that the beginning of a song could come so quickly. And then when we got back to her hotel, I wrote the rest of a, 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 a possible first verse, which I later completely changed. But the idea was there, the kernel, the acorn from which the oak grew was there. And over a period of a couple of months, I, I worked on the rest of the lyrics and, and a few of those helpful niggles and itches propelled me to the final final work. And and also was, what was important about Holy Moon was that the piano, the funny piano style, I was, as I say, I was self-taught on piano. I can't play that dexterous way that real piano players can. I play like a bit like Elton John and Gilbert Sullivan. I've got one finger here doing the bass stuff and I've got three fingers here doing the chords. And and I've various rhythms. I've the girl called Johnny rhythm doing which is is a sort of shuffle rhythm, and then the whole of the moon rhythm is like this. This one's doing just a straight... I suppose those are fours, aren't they? And this one's doing a, an offbeat. Put them together, and you get this beautiful rhythm. I discovered that one's about 18 or 19, and I've written lots of songs in that rhythm. <laughs> But none of them ever got a chance before the whole of the moon. Finally, I found a song that worked with that rhythm. 
I know it so well I can talk while doing it. <laughs> it's like this. Yeah. I know that you're not comfortable performing that for us, for the cameras. Yeah. But would you indulge me in a verse and a chorus of it, please? Do you know, it's very hard on the guitar. It doesn't actually work on... It depends on... On this, if we had a piano, I'd be happy to. But it depends on that, you see. If I play it on guitar, it's been covered on guitar. You know, a lot of people we cover it on guitar. We just want to illustrate the story in a little one. It's, you know, it sounds all wistful on guitar. It's just these chords all the way. I picture the rainbow You held it in your hands I had flashes But you saw the planet And so on. My voice hasn't woken up yet. That's great. Yeah, you're welcome. Right. For the stars And you know how it feels to reach too high I saw the crazy 